Okay. Um, my computer clock says it's uh, time to start. So welcome everyone to this uh, seventh webinar in the WBS webinar series. We have the pleasure today to welcome Professor Emil Kakao from the Northwestern University in the United States. And he will give us a presentation today on the, on the data rescue uh, topic. And the title of his presentation is Historical Seismograms Preserving an Endangered Species. Emil Okal uh, was invited to give this presentation by uh, Bernard Minster, uh, the past chair of the Scientific Committee of the World Data System. Um, a quick logistical announcement, as you might have seen or heard, the audio is broadcasted through your computer, and so use your uh, headset uh, to, to listen to the webinar in case you do not uh, receive the, the audio, make sure that your volume is up and um, you will be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation using the question and answers panel available through the WebEx um, interface. Um, please use the question and answers uh, panel even during the presentation and add your questions as they come and we will deal with them and uh, Emil will answer them, um, will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So now I'm handing over uh, the floor to Emil for his presentation. Please, Emil. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mustafa, for uh, hosting uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you, Mustafa and Donald, for um, giving me the opportunity uh, to present uh, my research in, uh, in this topic and to share with you perhaps my my uh, concerns about the preservation of, of this endangered uh, species. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, historical seismograms, and um, a seismogram is, of course, a, a record of an earthquake, and uh, they are particularly valuable because it turns out that seismic cycles, uh, which can be thought of as the, uh, the time separating major earthquakes on a fault, are very long uh, with respect to the history of seismology, of the science uh, which studies earthquakes. Typically, um, major earthquakes can recur uh, along uh, active faults with um, a, a recurrence time. I'm very careful not to use the word period because it's not a periodic phenomenon, um, which may be several centuries. And yet we have uh, had uh, records of, uh, of earthquakes for only about 120 years now, and um, the digital era uh, during which we have recorded um, earthquakes on, um, uh, in, a, in a digital support uh, with the use of uh, computers um, lasts only for about 40 years right now. And so very clearly, we are understanding the, the seismicity in many areas, and uh, if we were to use only digital um, seismograms, we would be in, a, in the position of somebody uh, who wants to study the phase of the moon and has only one week of data. So this is why uh, seismic networks are, um, uh, historical seismic networks are so valuable. Before the digital era, uh, which means uh, before uh, 1977, we relied on, on uh, uh, recording analog uh, records, uh, principally on photographic paper. And if we go back even farther in time, uh, we were recording on smoke paper uh, through the use of mechanical instruments. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the digital era um, has featured not only a different way of recording, but also a different kind of instruments what we call broadband instruments, which uh, um, record the, the whole spectrum of, of seismic waves, uh, both at high and low frequencies. In a sense, we are re recording the whole symphony that the Earth is, uh, is um, playing to us. Uh, before that, uh, there was, uh, immediately before the digital era, uh, there used to be a network called the, the Worldwide Standardized Seismic Network, uh, which lasted from about 1963 and 1970 to 1976, 
and which uh, consisted essentially of uh, short period and long period instruments which were recording on photographic film. And uh, this uh, network was uh, developed initially uh, by uh, the U.S. Air Force uh, to, uh, to monitor the, um, the uh, limited uh, test ban treaty um, which uh, went uh, into, um, into existence in 1963 uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, which, and the, uh, the network in question was developed to monitor the compliance of the treaty. But of course, uh, the records were made available to scientists, and uh, if, um, uh, if we can remember this network for one uh, particular uh, result, fundamental result in science, is the fact that it proved the, uh, the plate tectonics concept, and the names of uh, Lynn Sykes, the Brian Isaacs, Peter Molnar come to mind as the people who uh, proved that actually the data uh, which, uh, which was recorded, which was being recorded at the time by this network, um, you know, um, provided a, a verification of the ideas about plate tectonics which were being developed at that time. Um, from the standpoint of conducting present research, it is possible to painstakingly uh, uh, digitize these, um, uh, these seismograms uh, using hand digitization such as on the table which is shown and uh, use the, the records, the um, the digitized records with, which are uh, produced in this fashion use them with the same kind of techniques that we, uh, that we use for uh, the, um, the modern digital data. And this is something, uh, for example, that my student uh, Wei Chang Wang in the 1990s um, realized by um, determining modern uh, focal solutions of, uh, of earthquakes uh, going comparable to the, um, the ones which are obtained automatically uh, from digital data these days uh, going back in time uh, during the, the WWSSN era. Before that, before 1963, before these wonderful uh, standardized networks, there were seismogram, uh, seismograph stations and therefore there were collections of seismograms. Uh, fundamentally, there were two types of, um, of instruments which were developed. Uh, the mechanical instrument, which was an entirely mechanical uh, seismograph, um, where the amplification was was obtained in a in a totally mechanical fashion, and therefore was limited to a gain of approximately 250 or so, and this was developed primarily by Emil Wiechert, um, who um, who was who became so famous for that that he was actually given a stamp recently by the German uh, post office. Um, the, uh, these, these constitute absolutely wonderful uh, records to study mega events of magnitudes greater than about eight. And actually, these instruments were so uh, reliable that a handful of them are still operating. The last one I saw was in the 1990 in Uppsala, uh, but some of them have been, um, in a sense, um, restored and, and have been put back to their original um, uh, function. Um, and I'm thinking, for example, of the instruments in Zagreb in Croatia. Um, towards the turn of the 20th century in 1900, um, a Russian prince by the name of Boris Galitsin uh, developed the electromagnetic seismograph, which uh, consisted of, um, of coupling uh, this, this me mechanical instrument uh, with um, uh, little coils, uh, which produced electrical currents, which could then be amplified um, and um, uh, recorded uh, using galvanometric techniques on photographic paper. Uh, that uh, allowed to boost the, the gain to about 1,500, but the, the other side of the coin was that uh, these, these instruments were not uh, recording the very low frequencies uh, seismic waves as well. Uh, they fell off faster with, with frequency, uh, but they remain absolutely excellent for earthquakes of magnitudes around seven. And they were, by the way, the ancestors of the uh, they were the ancestors uh, of the pressing instruments which uh, um, which uh, were um, uh, featured in the WWSSN. Uh, I should say also that um, uh, during the 30s, Hugo Benioff at Caltech uh, developed a few superb instruments, uh, including uh, uh, a number of. Uh, of remarkable swing meters which were operated at Caltech until the, the early 2000s and which are incredibly precious 
uh, in the field of very, very long period seismology. So armed with these, these kinds of, of instruments, what can we do? Um, we can, um, of course, also relocate earthquakes, and I'm go not going to, uh, to spend too much time uh, to make sure we know exactly where they took place. Um, the, uh, I'm going to pass along this because uh, I will run out of time otherwise. Um, and focusing on the historical seismograms, uh, I want to give you an example here of the incredible quality of some of these records. This is an old V-shirt record at Jakarta, and um, for those of you who are not seismologists, um, what we see here is the arrival of, a, uh, of an earthquake wave, and what is absolutely precious to us is that this first motion uh, is up on the seismogram. And that means that the, this particular instrument recorded a northward motion of the Earth for this particular earthquake. And this is a, a tremendous information regarding the geometry of the earthquake in question. And for example, in this particular case, this record by itself can eliminate uh, the possibility that these this earthquakes in the, in the Kuril Islands uh, would be a regular subduction event uh, because the variety should be just the opposite. So uh, this is the kind of thing which is incredibly precious, and we haven't had uh, such a, uh, an event duplicated in recent time. So the fact that these particular cooling earthquakes at that particular location um, had this anomalous, in a sense, behavior uh, is, is a very important fact in, um, uh, in the reconstruction of the seismicity of this particular zone. So, um, what we can do, as I say, is focus on some of the very long periods, for example, oscillations uh, that can be recorded here on, the, on a string meter at Pasadena. Uh, this is the, the passage of a, of a love wave, and what you see on the, on the uh, lower part of the, of the figure is the, the passage of subsequent waves, which have gone several times around the Earth, that we call G3, G, G4, and so on. And we can, as I said, painstakingly digitize those, transform these into uh, digital signals that we can process from, uh, with computers uh, so that we get spectral amplitudes, which can uh, give rise to a, a better understanding of the true size of the earthquake, uh, what we call its moment magnitude, and, um, and generally apply the same techniques that um, would be available uh, to uh, digital records in an automated fashion nowadays. Uh, one such uh, method that I developed in collaboration with a colleague in, in Tahiti, uh, we call the PDFN from preliminary determination of focal mechanisms. And to give you an idea, we were able to, um, to reconstruct uh, the geometry of um, a couple of fascinating events on this particular date, uh, two magnitude eight events, uh, which occurred within half an hour of each other at the opposite ends of the Pacific. And uh, since then, um, I applied this method to many other areas, which uh, um, include, for example, the Bonin Mariana uh, um, subduction zone, where I was able to prove with some collaborators uh, that indeed there is, um, there, there is a, a list, a history of seismicity at levels that uh, were unsuspected using only modern data. So um, we can apply these techniques also to high frequency um, records using, for example, the, the superb instruments which Hugo Benioff developed at Caltech. Um, going back all the way to 1932, we were able to document in the case of these Mexican events that one of them was uh, a slow event giving rise to a much larger tsunami than uh, would have been expected from, from its magnitude. Um, and uh, I will now uh, address the, the fundamental part of this, uh, uh, of this uh, talk, which is what can we do with these old collections and how can we preserve them? In order to, um, to cast this into uh, the, the sense of urgency uh, that uh, I want to share with you, I, I have here represented uh, the monster of the, Ap of the apocalypse uh, from a Greek uh, recording. And um, I have had in my career the tendency, a certain tendency, uh, to identify it with some of our university administrators and bean counters, uh, which uh, have 
had to be persuaded uh, very, um, uh, very um, uh, painstakingly that uh, these uh, collections are absolutely priceless. What is the state of these collections? The WWSSN collections uh, were bought by um, a large number of university laboratories during the 60s and 70s. Uh, they were uh, bought by, um, from the, um, a central office which made them available at the USGS. And uh, to this day, I, I think I can say that only three collections uh, which achieved some level of completeness survive to this day. And they are uh, one of them in Albuquerque, where the collection is believed complete at the USGS facility. However, the access to this facility is difficult, and there are no digital scanning facilities in Albuquerque. Um, for the record, uh, the, the Albuquerque uh, um, laboratory uh, sits on a, an Indian reservation and um, is not accessible to the general public without making uh, previous arrangements. The second collection is at Lamont, which is the laboratory of Columbia University. It is very complete. It is in deep, in deep storage, and the access is somewhat difficult um, because of, um, of it being in, in uh, commercial deep storage. I was very fortunate in the past five years or so that uh, Northwestern University agreed uh, through, persuas uh, through persuasive action on my part uh, towards my administrators um, to, uh, um, to salvage the collection from Caltech, which was, um, which was earmarked for, for disposal and shredding. And um, this collection is now hosted at Northwestern University. Uh, the access is, taught, is, is academic, and so it's a, a, perfectly, um, a perfectly accessible facility. All you have to do is, is get in touch with me, and we, and we can go at any time, even during weekends. And um, uh, we have a modern large-format printer, which, which allows printing on a, um, on, uh, at a format of 18 by 24 inches. And then we have a digitizing table, uh, which allows uh, the hand digitizing of the records to, uh, uh, to a digital uh, format. Um, as we uh, progress towards more historical collections, um, I must mention a global initiative by my colleague uh, William Lee uh, from the USGS, uh, which took place in the 1980s and which consisted of microfilming a, a number of targeted stations, Pasadena, Tucson, Honolulu, and so on. And uh, these, these are available now in the form of uh, films uh, of RAW, uh, which are kept uh, at the USGS facility in Menlo Park, at Golden, uh, at the Golden facility of the USGS. And to a lesser extent, uh, at Northwestern, we have some, um, uh, some uh, fraction of these, of these collections available. Um, there, there, is also, there was also an effort in Göttingen uh, by Professor Duda of Hamburg to film, uh, to microfilm all the, the events recorded above magnitude 7 at Göttingen, uh, which are V-shirt instruments, and this complete collection is available at the USGS uh, in Golden in the form of a microfilm. Uh, outside of, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, situation, um, we uh, essentially um, are faced with individual laboratories, individual um, observatories which have archived their collections in very different ways. And um, uh, for many of them, they are faced with um, imminent uh, shredding and uh, with, the, uh, with generally disposal because of the, of the lack of perception of their value by administrations. Such is the case of Pasadena, for example, where uh, the, the years from 63 to 1980 were not scanned, and, which, and uh, the collection was salvaged in, uh, in 2011, where it was, uh, when it was facing imminent shredding at the very last, uh, and told him at a matter of days, uh, by my colleague Willie Lee, and it has been accepted uh, right now by the State Archives of California. So it is somewhere in, in Sacramento, it is uh, probably immune from uh, disposal, but it is essentially inaccessible to a scientist because it hasn't been organized in any kind of, um, uh, of um, uh, cataloged uh, fashion. I should say that uh, 
some um, uh, some um, uh, famous uh, laboratories and uh, and uh, observatories, seismic observatories, has maintained collections such as Weston and Berkeley. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, in Weston, uh, Massachusetts, the uh, the collection is well maintained. There is a commitment to maintaining it, and the scanning is in progress. Uh, similarly, in Berkeley, in San Luis, probably in Tucubaya, in, in Mexico, uh, the, the collections are maintained, uh, but the, the question of their systematic scanning is, is pending. Uh, an absolutely superb effort is being conducted by Professor Miyaki Ishii at Harvard, um, and she has embarked in a, in a, um, a remarkable project of high-resolution scanning of a full archive uh, of Harvard Station, and um, the scans are deposited regularly on a dedicated website. And the only problem, uh, if, I, if I may say, is that the, um, the, um, uh, the density of scanning is so high and the scanning is so perfect that downloading these files takes forever and, um, and hits many times uh, limitations due to uh, the um, uh, due to the, uh, uh, the downloading computer itself, because each file is more than 1.5 gig, uh, gigs. But uh, this is uh, otherwise uh, an, absolutely, uh, an absolutely superb uh, project. Outside of North America, I should mention the, the effort in the build in the Netherlands, where they have absolutely superb archives, primarily of Galician records, which are remarkably complete. My, my experience has been that perhaps in many years of visiting these archives, uh, I found one seismogram missing, and they are perfectly maintained in the basement of the observatory of the Royal uh, Netherlands Meteorological Institute, and uh, they have a, a large-scale scanner available, so you can go there and, and uh, uh, scan uh, these, uh, uh, these very precious seismograms. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, uh, the situation is, is very variable. In Uppsala, uh, they have excellent archives which have been remarkably uh, maintained, but unfortunately the access has become difficult in recent time. They have uh, centralized this in university archives which are not accessible, not even to the visiting scientists. You have to, to have their staff personally take the, uh, the seismograms to you, and they, and they have no scanning facilities. Um, in Italy, uh, there was a major project of comprehensive scanning, uh, which uh, unfortunately has a regional emphasis, which means that either these are, uh, either these are um, only Italian stations or these are European stations for Italian earthquakes. Uh, but um, there, is, there is not, uh, uh, you know, um, a, the, um, the general European stations are not available for earthquakes outside of Europe. Uh, Athens has a very good, um, a very good um, uh, archives uh, dating back as far back as 1908, and boxing and filing is underway. Uh, the scanning capabilities are red, uh, what I describe as rudimentary because the, the format is just uh, too small. Um, elsewhere, elsewhere in the world, and I seem to have trouble moving. Yes. Elsewhere in the world, uh, things are, are very um, um, variable. Uh, La Paz has been known for having excellent archives, which are very well maintained with a strong commitment to keeping them. But unfortunately, there is no scanning capability, and the exchange has proven uh, growingly difficult in, in the past few years. Uh, Cape Town has a very limited uh, uh, archive um, uh, data set, which scan, spans only um, about 25 years, and it is located in Pretoria. Uh, but um, uh, to my great surprise, at my last visit, I discovered that the whole um, uh, data set had been scanned, and the project uh, had been completed and is, um, is uh, available upon request. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, there are there is a, an absolutely superb collection, a real gold mine of, of seismograms uh, going back to the 1910s uh, with uh, not only the, the New Zealand stations but also Apia, which was originally a German station in the Samoa, um, which, is, uh, which is filed in, in New Zealand. Unfortunately, uh, there are no scanning facilities, uh, which, uh, uh, which um, is um, unfortunate. Uh, in, uh, in Australia, 
Uh, there was a superb project when I last visited there, um, where the, the um, uh, Geoscience Australia was scanning uh, more than three million seismograms, and they had approximately two and a half years um, uh, of work ahead of them. Uh, but the latest that I heard is that the, uh, the um, apocalyptic uh, monster took the form of the uh, government of Australia cutting down all the uh, support uh, to a large part of Geoscience Australia, and therefore their project has been uh, put on hold. And this is, in a sense, a great shame. Um, in, uh, in other parts of, of Asia, and uh, there is a, a superb uh, project which, uh, uh, which took place um, uh, in Mizuzawa in Japan at the Latitudinal Observatory, uh, where their complete collection has been scanned on more than 1,000 DVDs, of which I've learned by, by sort of uh, uh, chance that a complete data set is available actually at Tohoku University. So uh, the whole collection has been scanned, and it's extremely valuable uh, for regional studies in that location. I want to say a few words now about the Jakarta project. Uh, the Jakarta archives, which were started by the Dutch in 1908, um, uh, feature a large volume, perhaps 70,000 records, uh, of uh, V-shirt uh, seismograms, and uh, which are particularly valuable because the station um, is, uh, uh, sits uh, geographically in a region where very, very few historical stations are available. And so, um, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the state of archival uh, is, uh, is uh, somewhat poor uh, due to the climate in, uh, in Indonesia. The records have suffered, and when you open the boxes, occasionally you find them in such a poor state uh, that uh, it, is, uh, it is out of the question to feed them into a scanner, which would, add a, uh, which would act as a shredder. So this being, um, uh, this being said, um, the, and given the, the value of these, uh, of these records, uh, I was pleased uh, to uh, obtain uh, generous funding uh, from the Earth Observatory of Singapore under the leadership of Professor Kerry C. And um, uh, they uh, gave us some seed money uh, to start a, a project of scanning, of uh, photographing, uh, of direct uh, uh, contactless photographing uh, of these records which are in such poor state that you don't, you don't want to think of, of touching them. Uh, and this project, uh, uh, took place uh, in 2014 uh, with the help of my colleague Stephen Kirby and of our um, Indonesian colleagues at the other end. And uh, uh, I can give you some very quick details. We used uh, this camera here, uh, a light table, uh, and a, an Apple MacBook Pro uh, computer, uh, all of which we brought as, as uh, checked luggage uh, in the, um, in the um, uh, airplane. And uh, uh, we were able uh, to scan um, approximately 500 seismograms uh, concerning events with at least one magnitude greater than 7.5 or uh, for regional events, one magnitude greater than 6.5. It's a very difficult question to select the events that you are going to, uh, to photograph. Uh, this gives you an idea of the, of the process there. Uh, you see that some of these records were actually torn, and you have to, as best as you can, uh, you have to try to put the pieces together um, before, uh, before filming. And um, as I said, we were able, in the end, uh, to scan approximately 450 uh, seismograms for this period of time from 1910 to 1935. And uh, we hope that we have uh, built uh, skills um, among our Indonesian colleagues. And uh, the last uh, that we've heard, uh, they are eager to continue the project um, for another year with the funds uh, that are uh, remaining. Um, very important in this respect is the documentation of the metadata, which consists in the case of seismograms, for example, to make sure that you know that a displacement here on the seismogram corresponds to a northward motion here, to a westward motion there, and then all these constants are giving you the, uh, the exact uh, uh, characteristics of the instruments which allow you essentially to define a gain as a function of period, 
and to tell you uh, from uh, so many centimeters on the on the record, uh, you know how many microns the Earth actually moved uh, during the uh, during the earthquake. And um, uh, we, of course, this is a, an important part of the documentation of the metadata, which goes with the preservation of the seismograms. Uh, in the, uh, the perspective is that our experience for, for a, uh, during that trip to Indonesia shows that a group of perhaps four or five people, which is, uh, uh, very, which is optimal for efficiency, uh, a large group, it's well known, uh, has a tendency to produce more entropy than signal, uh, can re realistically process about 15 records per hour, including instruction from boxes, identification, preparation, photographing, and so on, and refiling. This is why you need a group of four to five people. And uh, uh, following, and it remains a gargantuan project, even on the scale of a small observatory like uh, Jakarta, because we are talking about 70,000 records. So uh, we are talking about a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and again, following successful capacity building, we hope that uh, that the project will be continued. And uh, uh, a critical aspect is that, um, especially in uh, in uh, third world countries or or developing countries, you can, your dollar goes a long way, uh, and uh, the um, you can design low cost projects in these countries. Uh, which can make a difference in terms of the preservation uh, of seismic archives. In the end, uh, I think the community, um, uh, in the end, the, the community needs you. In the end, the, con the community needs um, a, a joint effort uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, observatories worldwide towards preservation and, and uh, transfer to digital uh, support of these uh, absolutely invaluable um, uh, records. And I see that I'm running slightly out of time. I want to leave uh, time uh, for questions, so I will stop here. I thank you for your attention, and I will be pleased to entertain your questions at this, at this point. Thank you, Emil. Um, this was an excellent presentation, um, and I think you captivated the audience, as I can tell from the statistics of attention of participants. Uh, we have speech now to about 30 participants, 30 attendees listening to your presentation. Um, now it's time to take questions, and we have a number of questions already uh, pending. So I will go through these, but before, I just wanted to um, ask a, a personal question. Uh, when it comes to your uh, personal experience at the Northern University, you said that you were very fortunate to have an understanding administration. So I was curious to know, have you managed to convert this apocalyptical monster into um, a kind of mythical unicorn? How did you manage that? Uh, I wish I knew, uh, because uh, essentially um, the same administrator who told me for 10 years that, was, that there was not a square foot um, of, uh, of free space in the university, uh, one day gave me a beautiful room in the basement of a building. <laughs> and so um, perhaps um, I, don't, I, I cannot explain. The same person suddenly um, was probably moved uh, by my, um, my, persuasion, my persuasion as to the value of, of the collection, and, um, and one day suddenly he made available a, a beautiful basement room for me. And I'm very thankful to him, but I cannot, I cannot forget that this is the same person who for 10 years told me there is not, there is not a square foot of room in this university. Okay, so the mystery will remain then. Yes, we absolutely. Have, <laughs> so we have a first question from Gail Clement, who is asking you uh, if you know about the Benioff seismogram at Caltech if they were digitized and made available openly. Um, well, <laughs> it's a very long story, and I'll be pleased to uh, perhaps contact uh, Gail uh, personally for all the details. But essentially, uh, what took place is that uh, during the effort in the 1980s under the, the leadership of Willie Lee, who actually worked with the Caltech people at the time, um, a, a, a fraction of the records was uh, 
was filmed, uh, but not digitized. Um, and uh, these are uh, these rolls of films which are available at the USGS. This filming project stopped in 1962, with the records in 1962, I believe. So from 1962 uh, on, uh, the, the venue of strain meters, these absolutely fantastic instruments, have not been um, have not been filmed, to my knowledge. Um, they were threatened with disposal. They are in the archives in Sacramento, um, but they haven't been scanned, nor have they been filmed systematically, to my knowledge. Hello? Thanks, Emil, for, for the, the reply. We have another question from Elizabeth Bracho. Um, hello, could you explain a little, a little about how you identified the records each archive held? Was it through personal contacts, or did you send an email questionnaire to relevant institutes or by some other methods? Uh, it, it, has been, uh, it has been really by personal contact and uh, by, uh, by personal knowledge over the years, um, uh, and uh, uh, by personal contact with uh, um, the curators of these, of these records at professional meetings, mostly. Okay, thanks for the answer, Emil. Um, I'm scrolling down to the next question um, from Bernard. He's asking, how do you reconstruct the instrument response and the gain for all records? This is a very I, I think, I, technical I'm sorry, question. I, I, I'm sorry, I did not understand the question. So the question is from Bernard, Bernard Minster, and he's asking, how do you reconstruct the instrument response and the gain for all records? Okay. Uh, there are, uh, it, it depends on the stations. Uh, some stations themselves have uh, very detailed archives of all the calibrations they were making. Uppsala, for example, was calibrating their instruments every month, and, and they have notebooks there uh, that can be consulted or scanned. Uh, other uh, observatories were doing it uh, a little bit less frequently, um, uh, and uh, they have been catalogues which were made, notably by Macomb and West in 1931, and later by Charlie and Van Gilles in Belgium in 1953, uh, which uh, are essentially catalogues of metadata to which you can, uh, you can refer. Thanks, Emil. Um, following question is um, from Marie, Maria Teresa Marino. And she's asking, what do you think is the best way to publicize our collection and digitalize data in order to reach as many potential users interested in, use that, in using them? Uh, I think we, um, uh, the, the best way is through, uh, I would say, through personal contacts at professional meetings, but, but another possibility uh, would be perhaps to uh, write a, a very short contribution to something like SRL, Seismological Research Letters, um, you know, uh, uh, which uh, I suppose uh, would be a, an adequate venue for a, uh, a kind of very short one, one to two page description of, uh, of a particular uh, archival uh, data set. Thanks, Emile. Another question from Bill Hauer, or Hauer, sorry if I'm mispronouncing uh, your name. Where has funding come for your preservation efforts? Pardon me? So Bill is asking where the funding comes for your preservation efforts. Uh, well, the, uh, the funding, uh, I've, in the case of, um, of the pilot project, at, um, uh, at Jakarta, the funding was generous, generously provided by the Observatory of Singapore. Um, I, I must say that this is a, a very a critical uh, question because essentially I have no specific funding uh, to embark in any kind of systematic preser preservation. 
And uh, part of the problem uh, with the Pasadena archives, uh, when they were threatened with disposal, is that they were kept uh, by my colleague, Willie Lee, who was personally paying the commercial uh, storage, which he at some point could, not, uh, could no longer afford. So uh, the funding is essentially, uh, with the exception of a few generous donors, whom I acknowledge very, very deeply, um, the funding is non-existent. Thanks, Emil, for the clarification. Um, another question from Victor to our panel. We have some yes. 30 years, uh, so he's saying we have some 30 years, five seismograph days, local, a local company wants lo a lot of money to digitize them. What do you advise? Can we send these papers somewhere in the USA for digitization? Well, uh, the problem that I see uh, is that the, the costs in the USA are going to be the same as in Puerto Rico, I think. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, I would make a, a difference between scanning and digitizing. Uh, scanning consists of preserving a, an image of a seismogram in a, in a digital form. Uh, digitizing, uh, which some people call vectorizing, consists of transforming that image into, uh, into the trace of a seismogram, which is a time series uh, that can be used by the individual uh, researcher. And, uh, I, uh, and, and of course, the, the, um, the end product would be uh, hopefully to, uh, to uh, scan uh, and digitize. Uh, but I think that, that these are two steps, and in terms of pure preservation, nothing is, is lost if you stop at the first step. Excellent. Thanks, Emil. Um, another question from Alberto Lopez. Hi, Emil. Do you scan all of them or only those of a particular interest when, for example, significant earthquake occurs? Yes. Uh, and. Uh, Hola, Alberto. Alberto was my PhD student, so it's always a pleasure to hear from him. Uh, but uh, uh, this, is a, this is a terribly difficult question because you have to decide what is noise and what is signal. And somebody's noise is the next scientist's signal. Uh, not only, uh, you know, because, uh, because a lot of emphasis has been given nowadays uh, to uh, to uh, processing what what is called noise and doing uh, you know background noise tomography and so on, but also because um, uh, you may be interested in a very minor uh, event uh, somewhere that uh, has a lot of value for the individual scientist. So it is a, a harrowing question, and when we went to Jakarta, we were faced with the with the strategic question. Uh, are we going to try to digitize everything, you know, and we start on one day and we take every day and we do as much as we can, or are we going to, to adopt a, a kind of magnitude filtering? And uh, I had the, the first, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the first attitude. I was in favor of digitizing everything. My colleague Steve Kirby told me, but this is unreasonable and you, we need to have such magnitude filtering. In the end, this is what we had to do, and, and it is an incredibly difficult uh, decision to take. Thanks, Emil. This is very interesting. And actually, there's another question exactly on the same topic, which I think you just addressed, but I will just uh, to acknowledge Mark Ferguson's question, read it. Uh, please comment on the value of the seismogram, which record periods of calm, no events, straight line readings, etc. These may comprise a significant number of the seismograms in any one collection, do these also have long-term value? I don't know if you want to add yes. to this, but I think you covered already. Uh, I, I, can, I can repeat very quickly what I said. There is a whole new field um, which has been, um, uh, you know, in the past five years or so, which has blossomed in the past five years, which, which, has, which consists of using background noise uh, because there is no such thing as a completely calm day uh, there is a little bit of background noise, which uh, uh, we think originates, you know, in the swell of the ocean or something, and, and people have digitized um, uh, what would have been considered background noise and, and have inferred quite a lot of things about the, the structural properties of the Earth from that. The other thing is, is that uh, uh, I was interested one day 
uh, in uh, in trying to track down a very very small hydroacoustic wave called the T wave, uh, which was recorded by an island station at the other end of the Pacific Ocean, and it, and it was there barely barely visible in at the level of the noise. It was just a change in um, it was just a change in frequency of the signal that you that you wouldn't have caught um, by just uh, you know a, a sort of uh, a sort of um, uh, first order look at the at the seismogram, and yet it was very valuable to my uh, to my research. And so again, uh, it is um, it is p perhaps uh, I wouldn't say a fallacy, but but it is a, <coughs> a kind of um, inadequate, inaccurate statement that a particular day is is completely calm seismically. Um, if you look deep enough, there is always something happening. Thanks, Emil, for the clarifications and the additional uh, comments. Um, one question from Alberto Lopez, which I would like to ask personally as well. Uh, he said, Emil, I remember you told me once Google at some point got interested in preserving seismograms. Did this interest vanish? And actually, my question question was, is there any private uh, company's interest in, in digitizing seismograms? Well, uh, yes, uh, at some point, uh, you know, Google um, wanted to, uh, to uh, scan all the books which had pu been published on, on the face of the earth. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, from the University of Santa Cruz, uh, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz, um, Emily, um, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed. Um, <laughs> Her last name, name escapes me. I'm really terribly embarrassed. But uh, who was a, a Caltech graduate? Um, she 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 looked into Emily Brodsky. Okay, uh, she looked into and, and I apologize for for this uh, uh, sudden failure in my, my memory. Emily Brodsky. She um, she looked into the question of salvaging these Pasadena records. And uh, uh, before they left Caltech and they came to, um, uh, to my, my friend Willie Lee at the USGS, uh, they were, uh, they were um, in a sense, transferred to Emily Brodsky, and she gave them to Google. And Google started scanning them, but they, they got cold feet. They didn't realize how many of them there were. And so at some point they said, now we, we, we just, we, just going to stop, and they returned everything to Emily, who said, I don't have a room at Santa Cruz to, to hold them. And then uh, uh, Willie Lee got, got hold of them, but then the USGS told him that, that, uh, uh, that the, um, the available space at the uh, USGS facility in Menlo Park was, was, uh, was not meant to, uh, to hold old seismograms, uh, which didn't belong to the USGS, and, and, um, and this is where he put them in, in um, uh, in private storage at his, at his own cost and uh, out of his own pocket, and then eventually had them donated to the state of California archives. So uh, the story with Google is that it sounded very good, but they, they got cold feet in the end. I see. So the interest was not a long-term interest. <laughs> We have two questions from Maria Teresa Marino, um, time is pressing, so we will take the, uh, we have to take like these as last questions, and we'll one more from Petros as well. So Maria Teresa is asking, which are the professional meetings, including this topic nowadays or in the near future, besides the ESC meeting? And another question is, is there any available soft I guess software we can use to digitize our smoke paper scan seismogram. Uh, I, I will answer the second question first. Uh, the, there is software um, which uh, which automatically digitizes um, analog records into time series, and this was this was uh, this is a very uh, very uh, worthy. Uh, program which was developed, uh, uh, among others, by my Italian colleagues in uh, in Rome, um, as part of their uh, their archiving uh, program. Um, the one problem with this is that um, when you deal with very large earthquakes, uh, the analog records be become in incredibly complex, uh, and because the tracers are all over the place. 
and uh, it is very difficult for these automatic softwares to actually follow uh, an individual trace. And the good old method of going there with, with color pencils and, um, and sweating it out to figure out which is exactly the trace, uh, in my opinion, is still somewhat superior. Uh, and then what was the first question, please? The first question was about professional meetings including this topic. In, in, excuse me, I, can't, I didn't get it very well. Yeah. So I think Maria Teresa is asking about professional meetings covering the, this topic you presented. Ah, the professional meetings, yes. Program. Yes, I, I attended a, a session in Prague uh, of the, uh, the meeting which was held in Prague, which I think was Jaspe in, um, in uh, June of this year. And, uh, uh, and there, was, there, there, were, there was a special session in the, in the evening, in the afternoon, um, which uh, had perhaps uh, 10 or so contributions. So uh, yes, I think that by all means, uh, um, the, it is important uh, in order to pass the word around uh, to, to organize such uh, sessions at professional meetings. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Amy. So the last question uh, will be from Petros Bodiak. Uh, I would like to say that in addition to the details uh, Dr. Okal gave about Harvard's project, we also have been working on the development of the DigiSpy software, which is capable to convert digital raster images of old seismograms into digital time series. Any, any comments? <laughs> Uh, well, okay, this, is, this is obviously this is obviously along the same lines as the uh, the, the Italian so-called vectorization uh, project, and uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I'm, uh, let me say that uh, uh, with the <laughs> with the personal uh, very slight reservation about the size of the of the of the files that uh, that come out of Harvard, and I'll be I'll be really. Um, uh, looking forward, perhaps, to contacting Petros personally on, uh, on this topic. Uh, you know, I'm a great fan of this of this project, and uh, and I think it's wonderful that uh, all these um, uh, these uh, um, uh, seismograms are are being uh, scanned and eventually, hopefully, digitized. And, and I want to uh, uh, congratulate um, Miyaki and, and Petros for their work in this respect. Not to forget Miyaki's mother, who is preparing the seismograms with a little brush to make sure that they are in the absolute perfect condition before they are scanned. Uh, very, very impressive okay. with, uh, with this project. It's a family business as well. <laughs> yes. So um, I think we have to close down now the, the, the session. I will just give some quick information, final information. Alberto Lopez mentioned, I think in response to uh, Maria Teresa, uh, there is a program, uh, TCO by INGV. Um, I think it's a, in response to Maria Teresa's question. I've put that into the, the chat window for, for her. Um, yes, finally, uh, I am, um, I am, I, sorry, Nick, go ahead. INGV is the um, is the institute in Rome. It's the Italian uh, uh, Italian Institute of Ge uh, Geophysics and Volcanology in Rome. So uh, I think Alberto may be referring to this uh, to this program that 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 is um, under which is um, uh, being uh, uh, which which is uh, being run in in Rome. And final note, um, I'm reminded by Elizabeth Bradshaw, and this is very good, that there will be um, a, um, um, a data rescue workshop in Boulder um, next year. Um, I believe it will be in September, and it will, it's not yet publicly announced, but uh, preparations for this workshop are uh, ongoing. It will be under the uh, aegis of the Research Data Alliance and the Data Rescue Interest Group uh, within the, the Research Data Alliance. So this is, uh, stay tuned if you're interested uh, on the data rescue topic. Emil, uh, thank I'm you very much for this captivating presentation. Uh, do we have any final uh, comments to make? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it, uh, it worked uh, uh, very well. I'm, I'm pleased that, uh, um, that uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I enjoyed all the questions from the audience uh, uh, very much, and um, I look forward to uh, keeping in touch with these uh, colleagues 
And, uh, and again, I thank uh, you and, and Bernard for the, the opportunity. Um, and certainly, I will consider going to Boulder because this is where my daughter lives. Excellent. But thank you. Um, just to inform the participants, um, the, the webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the WDS website, uh, including the question and answer session. Um, the slide also, if Emil uh, gives us the permission, will be made available on the website. Obviously, obviously, you, you can have the, uh, the presentation. Um, and I will be pleased to uh, be in touch with, uh, with anyone to um, answer subsequent questions when they look at the details of the slides. Excellent. Thank you very much, Emil. And uh, now it's time to, to close the webinar. Please stay tuned for the next uh, WDS webinar. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, and thank you very much. Goodbye.